Good morning, Baku International Fellowship. We are happy that you have chosen to be a part of today's service with us. Baku International Fellowship is an English-speaking, multinational, multi-denominational family of Christian faith. We are growing in a loving relationship with both God and with each other. Here at BIF, it's always all about Jesus. Uh, and Tim is in the middle of a sermon series on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' most famous teaching. Um, and he's going through the Sermon on the Mount verse by verse by verse or section by section, which means that today's section has a slight PG rating. You know, if you are going to view a movie at, at the Flame Tower Cinema, you see the rating on it. And PG means parental guidance is suggested. So um, today's passage of scripture deals with uh, adultery and lust. And so might good might be a good day for your kids to go out for children's church and uh, find a video in another room for them to watch or something like that. But um, it's really important that we look at all parts of God's word, not just the easy parts, but the hard parts. The hard parts speak to us just as much, if not more, than the easy parts. So um, that's what today's service is going to be about. We're glad that you're here. You know that um, if you've been watching the past couple weeks, we're trying to have the new people introduce themselves um, in, in the videos, one each week. And so if you are a new person and you have not um, signed up to receive BIF's emails um, or you have not had the opportunity to introduce yourself to the BIF family of faith, if you could uh, send Tim an email, t underscore feather at sbcglobal.net. And we would love to uh, get you on the screen. And you might not be able to see people, but people would be able to get to see you. And then um, we'll be able to see each other in face to face one of these days. So let's pray together and we'll start the service. Jesus, we thank you for your word. Thank you that you are so practical and so relevant. You deal with uh, every part of our lives, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And Lord, we just pray for uh, each of our hearts today that our hearts would be open to hear from you. Um, we want to worship you. We want to honor you. Uh, we don't want to just push under the rug things that you have said. You said it, which means it's important. So Lord, open our eyes, open our minds, and help us to see you more fully. Help us to live our lives. Um, to honor you. We pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Good morning, BIF. Welcome to worship today. We're going to start off with a hymn called How Firm a Foundation. And the second and third verses are written as if God is speaking to us. And let's rejoice together in these promises that he's given us and his faithfulness and his love for us. Thank you. 
Well, good morning, Baku friends, uh, far and near. You know, there are still folks who are in Australia and Europe who are tuning into our uh, premier uh, worship gathering. And uh, there's others of you who tune in later on on Sundays uh, back in North America to, uh, uh, to be a part of our worship gathering at uh, Baku International Fellowship. Good to have you along this morning. Hey, I'm, I want to jump right into the scriptures today because we have a lot of things to cover today. Uh, last week, we began jumping into the, to the areas, the specific areas that Jesus addresses in his Sermon on the Mount. And the one thing that, we, that, that I hope you pulled from last week was that Jesus and God place a very, very high priority on interpersonal relationships. And last week, we talked about uh, people who rub us the wrong way and we get angry over. And, and we focus in upon the fact that uh, our love is what tells the, the world that, that Jesus dwells in, within us. It, it is our love that uh, brings glory to God in this world today. Well, uh, today, we're going to turn our attention to uh, uh, the, the most important relationship in our life. Uh, in fact, this week and next week are, are focused in upon the marriage relationship. Now, I want to tell you that that neither this week nor next week we'll be able to cover everything that you want to cover. We won't be able to look at all of the questions and concerns and, well, quite frankly, your objections to what we might talk about here in these next two messages. In fact, I can't remember ever preaching to a, a congregation on these two passages of Scripture. I certainly have used them a number of times in speaking to men's groups and uh, talking with them and, and, and with individual men about struggles that they were having with uh, sexual immorality and lust. And, and quite frankly, as a youth pastor, well, I always knew I could get a big crowd of kids to a youth group on a given night when I would say the, the week before, hey, next week we're going to do sex and dating. And boy, they'd come out. <laughs> they would all come out for that. Well, uh, there are things in these messages that um, will challenge you. And I like the fact that, that, uh, that we're not just skipping around to the things that are comfortable to talk about. The expository preaching does that. It, it makes you look through a, a passage of Scripture, verse by verse, sometimes word, to, word by word, in order to draw out what God is saying to us. And, and in expository preaching, we can't skip over uh, the hard parts. So 
these messages, I believe, have something to say to all of us, young and old, single, uh, married, uh, all of this have, God will speak to us in some way. I do think that there are some of you who really need to hear some things and take them to heart. I'm going to ask you for some extra grace. Um, I'm going to say some things that um, might be controversial. They, they, might, they might bother you. What's he saying that for? I don't agree with that. Uh, when you feel those tensions in your soul, uh, I would ask you uh, to go deeper. Say, say to the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, why am I so bothered by this? What is, what is uh, the thing that is making me so angry or uh, upset about what is being said here? And Take it to him and ask him to, to go deeper into your hearts. Because remember, remember we said this last week, and it's, it's really a recurring theme throughout the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus takes what is the surface issues and says, let's get to the heart of the matter. It's not talking about the, the actual physical uh, interactions. He's talking about what is in our hearts. And the Holy Spirit wants to go deeper into your heart, all of our hearts, and and expose my I've been challenged these past couple of weeks looking at this passage of scripture and I I want to trust God to, to work in our hearts and our lives so would you would you look to the Lord with me and ask him to, to speak to us and our hearts father we thank you that you have made us like we are we are fearfully and wonderfully made God you have put you've hardwired us for desire and Lord you had specific purposes specific things in mind when you put this, this capacity for such intense desire in our lives. And so, God, today we're, we're asking you to come and help us to channel that desire. Help us, Lord, to see the places where we allow desire to, to take us away from the, the real purposes, the real mission of, of desire in our lives. And help us, Lord, to, to focus our attention upon the things that really matter in our hearts and our lives. God, give us all grace. Give us the the wisdom and the insight. Help us to grow in our knowledge of God and of ourselves and help us, Lord, to, to be honest, to be very real about what's going on in our hearts today with ourselves and with you. So that, Lord, when, when we finish today's message, there might be some things that bother us, but, Lord, we'll be honest with you and honest with ourselves and, and maybe honest with other people to talk through these issues and help us, Lord, to become more like Jesus. God, our heart's desire, our, our passion, our great desire is to become more like you. And so, Jesus, come and work in our hearts and our lives today. Help us to see you. Help us to see your goodness, your glory, your grace. We ask this in the precious and most powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Hey, uh, you know, we've been uh, asking new friends to introduce themselves and then read the passage of Scripture that we're preaching on, the, the text for that particular morning. But I, I had an uneasy feeling about asking a new friend to uh, uh, tell us who they are and then read about lust and adultery. I didn't think that would be the appropriate way to introduce them to you. So I asked my best friend if they would uh, read to you this morning's passage of Scripture from which we'll preach. So was I the best friend that you were expecting? Maybe so, maybe not. Uh, but I'm going to read to us the next portion of the Sermon on the Mount that Tim's going to be talking about today. From Matthew 5, verses 27 to 30. Jesus is speaking. You've heard it said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out, throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Thank you, honey, for reading our text for this morning's message, and uh, I want to dive right into it. The question that we are looking at here is, how do we live pure lives in a world that is saturated in sexual immorality? Uh, the verse that came to mind as I, I thought about that was from 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. 
I'm going to begin in verse 3 here just to capture this. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him. That's Jesus, who called us by his own glory and goodness. He's called us into a life of glory and goodness and purity. And through these, through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. The Sermon on the Mount is a manual of, of what godliness, glory, and goodness look like. Jesus is saying, this is what I, what I came to bring you. This is the kind of life that I'm offering you. So how does Jesus tell us to live pure lives in what it amounts to a cesspool? Now, I, I know those of you who are in, uh, from the United States even might not know what a cesspool is. It's a, a septic tank, uh, the sewer, uh, the wastewater from our homes, from our toilets goes into the cesspool, and that really is a good character of the, the sexual immorality in our world today. Well, Jesus begins by saying this, you've heard it said, do not commit adultery, but I say to you, we talked about this a little bit last week, Jesus is speaking with authority. He's not speaking and, and rehashing things. He's, he's taking people deeper into what the, the law truly means and, and, and the significance of it to our hearts. Jesus wants you to obey. He wants you to listen to him, and he wants you to obey him. And this is another one of the big ten, the, the big commandments, the, the ten commandments. And there, he's, he's rehearsing that one that says, do not commit adultery. You know what was a capital offense? Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10 tells us that, that, that when a, a man and a woman were caught committing adultery, they were to be stoned. To death. Now, the understanding in Jesus' day was that, well, anything else up to the, the actual act of, of committing adultery was okay. No big deal. The Pharisees had, had written that into their code so that they could get away with it. They said, well, we can't commit adultery, but how close to the edge can we get? And really, the the Pharisees were the ones who controlled the social norms. They controlled the, what was right and what was wrong in their world. And what controls what is right and wrong in our world today? What controls what is right and wrong in your life? For the world, it's pretty much pop culture. It's what the, the popular culture says. It tells us what is right and wrong. And quite honestly, today, pop culture across the globe is that nothing is wrong. Everything is right. Do what you feel like. Do what makes you happy. Do whatever it feels good to do at the moment. But genuine followers of Jesus Christ, people who have placed their faith and trust in Jesus and have accepted him into their life and now have the Holy Spirit living within them, we find ourselves making compromise. We, we don't always listen to what the Spirit would say is right and wrong, and we find ourselves making compromises to what Jesus has stay, said. Too often, we are, our ears are tuned into the pop culture more than it is to God's Word. What, what is the, the intake of Bible? What's the ratio of Bible intake to pop culture intake in your life? The TV, the the music, the, the movies, the, the commercials that you watch, the, the internet that you view. Um, that compared to how much time you spend in the Bible, how much time you spend with Christians talking about the things of, of heaven. Uh, most of you know I, I like to run. I don't, I, I would, I'm more of a jogger, I admit that, but, but I like to run with music. And for a number of years, actually, I've a run listening to uh, to 70s and 80s rock music. The, the music that I went through as a, a teenager and as a young adult. And, and I'd be jogging along, and it, it, it was, most of the music is really good for jogging and running. And um, then one day I, I was back in my, my back in the apartment, and I thought, you know, I, I found myself humming along and singing some of the songs that I had been listening to. And I was evaluating the words that I was singing. Now, I don't think that they, <clears throat> they really impacted my life greatly, but all of a sudden I realized I don't want these words impacting my life. I don't want them affecting how I judge what is right and what is wrong. I, I, these are not words that, 
are full of, of God's goodness and glory and, and godliness. That, that's not where I'm at with these words. And so I, I switched to um, instrumental jazz music. And I like that because, well, the instrumental jazz would be a song that come along, I could kind of slow down, and then it'd be another puppy song, and I could get my breath, after I got my breath back, I could be running a little bit harder. And I enjoyed that for a long while. But then um, a couple of months ago, I was going through a very stressful time. And actually, it was right after the stressful time, there had been some, some things that occurred that were were a relief, and I was just, I was praising God that he had got me through that stressful time, and I thought, I, I just want to put some Jesus music in, and I found a, a good worship channel and put that on and, and listened to that, and the first song that came up was Mercy Me's Flawless, and I stood in the park getting my warm-ups, getting ready, and I just was just overwhelmed with awe and wonder and glory, and I People must have looked at me kind of weird. There I am dressed to, to run, and I'm standing there with my hands up in the air, bawling my eyes out, worshiping Jesus. And I want to tell you, that run that day, I felt more power, more strength, more victory over, over all kinds of sin than I have felt in a long time. I, I, I really sense the, the power of Jesus' name, glorifying and honoring Jesus. And so I've kept listening to Jesus music in my, my earphone, earphones when I'm, I'm running. Uh, what, what's the ratio of, of Bible intake, of, of, of glorifying, honoring Jesus to being enamored with the pop culture of our world? Is Jesus really Lord of your life? If he's not Lord of your life, you know, this is going to be a very frustrating series for you because he's calling you to, to godliness, to goodness, to his glory. And if you want to argue with him all along the way, this is going to be really frustrating. you got to make him Lord of your life. Say, yes, Jesus, I, I will listen and I will obey. Will you make that commitment to him right now? Maybe, maybe just take a moment and say, Jesus, I... I want you to be Lord of my life. Help me. Give me a willing spirit to follow you, to listen to you, and to obey you in all these areas. The other thing that Jesus wants you to understand is the power of desire. Look at verse 28. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. There are a lot of other versions, translations that have this word lustfully uh, worded differently. I like this one. Anyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her. Uh, understanding this then, we, we want to understand the power of desire in our lives. <clears throat> That's what he's talking about here. The, the look is not what is sinful. He doesn't say anybody who looks at a woman has already committed adultery. No, uh, the it is lust it is it is looking with a lustful intent the look is the temptation and we will always be tempted there will always be those temptations around us but now what do we do with those temptations do we let those temptations feed our desire and one older man tell me one time you know uh, you can't stop the birds from flying over your head but you can keep them from building a nest in your hair and that's really the, the issue that Jesus wants you to understand. There, there, there will be temptations that will come to us. And, and he tells us in, through the Apostle Paul in Corinthians that there is no temptation that has taken you, which is not common to man. But God will make a way to keep the birds from making a nest in your heart and life. The, the word there, lust, is epithumio. And it simply means desire. And really, in it, on its own, it, it doesn't have any good or bad uh, connotations. It's just desire. And desire is judged to be good or bad by the object of that desire. So when desire is uh, directed in the wrong direction, when we are on a bad path of desire and the object of our desire is wrong, it results in shame. It results in shame in our heart. Uh, 
People who are truly born again of the Spirit have the Holy Spirit within them that gives them a, a sensitivity to things that are wrong. And you can grow in your sensitivity to what is wrong, or you can uh, dull that sensitivity. A lustful desire, a desire that is headed in the wrong direction for the wrong object, is a foothold of shame that the devil will use in your life. He will use that foothold to, to gain entrance and to establish a, 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 a fortress sometimes in our hearts and our lives of shame and embarrassment. But desire, the, 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 the core aspect of desire is something that God designed. He created us with desire, and he created us with the desire to submit this most important relationship in our life, the marriage relationship. God had hardwired desire into our souls and the purpose to bond the husband and the wife. Ephesians chapter four, five talks about this. Man will leave his father and mother and will cling to his wife and the two will become one flesh. God's, God's design for sexuality is that it would bond the husband and wife together. And so when our desire is, is focused in upon that, uh, there is nothing better. Thank goodness that God had the Song of Solomon uh, included in the Bible so that we could see that there is a, a beauty in this desire for sexuality. But it's what it's aimed at. Is it towards my wife and my husband? Or is it, is it aimed at something wrong? Is the object of my desire something that is, is out of, of God's boundaries? The power of lustful desire breaks the bond and it diminishes the sacredness of marriage. There's a difference here between men and women, and we need to understand that this, the text here today kind of focuses in upon men, but, um, but the lust can be part of women. But it's not just the, the lust of, of physical pleasure, there's a, there's a greater a broad, much broader understanding of what this lust is. And I think Jesus had that in mind. For men, that lust is, is focused in upon the visual, the physical, the body parts. For women, it's emotional closeness, personal intimacy. And so a woman can look at another man and with lustful intent, she thinks that that man would be able to meet greater personal, intimate, um, emotional needs in her life than her husband can. And so there's a, there's a lust, not just in the, the physical realm, but, but in the emotional realm, in the personal intimacy realm. Why, why is adultery, why is adultery such a horrible sin? Well, why is lustful intent looking lustfully at a, a woman or looking lustfully at another man? Why, why is that such a, a bad thing? Well, it distorts the picture that God wants to present to this world of his relationship with his people. Uh, Old Testament and New Testament, both, uh, there's a, a, a constant theme of the marriage relationship being a reflection of God's love his care, his concern for his people. It is really a picture of the glory of God's love. And so every time a, a marriage, every time a marriage is marred, every time there is adultery, every time there is a, a look of look uh, uh, with, with lustful intent, my friends, it mars the picture that God wanted to present to this world. Well, Jesus also wants to examine the, the deepest part of our heart's desire. Notice there that the, the adultery is in within the heart, in his heart. You see, lustful desire is an indicator of something else that is going on in our hearts. And so when this lustful desire comes along, we need to look at uh, other issues of the heart. I was looking for a good illustration of, of what I'm talking about here. And I came across a, a story by a, a counselor uh, in an article that uh, 
that talked about one of his clients. His client's name was Tom. Tom was 35 years old when he came to this counselor, and, and uh, he'd come to Christ. He'd been saved at an age of about 15, and so now, now Tom is telling his counselor, now for 20 years I've been struggling with this lustful desires in my life. He told the counselor about how, how much he had tried. He had tried everything. I mean, and literally Tom had done all the right things to, to stop the, the lustful desires in his life. He had a, an accountability partner. He bi memorized Bible. He, he got involved with the youth group thinking, well, if I got real involved with service to God, that would take care of things. He even tried fasting and prayer. Nothing worked. And so the counselor said, you know, when Tom came to him, well, what do I do? I, I, I don't have anything more to suggest to him. He, there, there's no other tricks in the, in the tool bag to, to be able to deal with this. So he wisely told Tom this. He said, I want you to keep a record of those times when you're tempted. You know, tell me when it happens and, and uh, where it happens. What's going on around you? What, what are you thinking? What are you feeling in those moments? What, are the, what, what other things are happening in your world? And, and Tom immediately came back. He said, I don't need a log to do that. I don't need to record anything. I, I'll tell you right away. It's on Friday and Saturday nights. And the counselor said, well, what do you mean? What happens? Well, Tom said, I, I work all week. I come home Friday, and there I sit in my apartment all alone. And I begin thinking about my friends who have girlfriends, and they're out having fun. And think about my friends who have, are married and, and the joy that they have with their wives and families, and I began to think. I began to get mad at God. I, and, and Tom was admit, admitted that, you know, I throw a tenter, temper tantrum at God at that point. I'm ang angry with him. Here I am. I'm all alone. And then he said, self-pity takes over. I began to, begin to, to think about uh, how this is not the way I should be treated. I deserve a break today, he says. And he said, God, God's cheated me. I feel like God has cheated me at that point. You know, at least he could do is give me a, a girlfriend. But all, the, all that I've done for him, all that I've done to try to get over this, why doesn't God help me out here? All of a sudden, Tom says, I, I just can't stand how I feel. At that moment, I just can't stand the, the, the anger and the feelings of frustration I have. And I know only one thing will give me a high. One thing will, will get me out of that funk, out of that feeling. And so he goes and he turns on the internet or he goes out and buys a, a magazine or he goes to a movie. Self-pity. You see, in doing this, in, in examining his heart, Tom found out that, well, there is a, an evil called self-pity that's feeding the lustful desire. There's, there's a grumbling against God, and, and that's a very dangerous thing. There's, there's envy. There's fantasies. He's, he's dreaming up things of, that, are, that he thinks are going on in these places, and he doesn't know. You see, we, <clears throat> these, things, these things feed a heart. They, they are sins that feed a, a lustful desire. We get all upset about the scarlet A, the, the big sexual sin. And we don't realize that that was a warning signal. That was an indicator that something else is wrong in our hearts and that we need to get straight. What is the cure for Tom's heart? What's the, what's the cure for his soul? What's the cure for your soul today? It is a reprogramming of our hearts and our minds to truth, realigning our hearts and our lives to truth, and, and examining our hearts, you know, inviting the Holy Spirit to come in, to, to shine his light on those areas, to, to ask them, the Holy Spirit, to, to usher in Jesus and his blood and his, his goodness to cleanse us and wash us and give us a new start, give us a, a freshness of soul so that we don't have those feelings. You know, we could go and get a fix but there's nothing like the precious blood of Jesus Christ to wash us and cleanse us. So does your soul need a touch today? If you, if you dig down deep, do you know that you're going to find things that mm, they need a touch of God? They need the, the forgiveness and the grace, the mercy of God. Oh, my friends, what a blessed place that is. What a holy place that is. Let him take you into the deepest resources of your heart. 
and examine the, the other areas that are contributing to any kind of lustful desire in your life. I think the next thing that Jesus wants us to be aware of is he, he wants us to be aware of just what feeds our desires. What are the things that give fuel to the desires in our heart? He talks about the, the bad things here in Matthew chapter 5, verses 29 through 30. He says, if your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Admittingly, now, Jesus is speaking in exaggerated terms. He does this a lot. Does he really mean to literally cut out our eye and cut off our hand? There are really times, there are moments when extreme measures are necessary in order to cut off the lifeblood of our lustful desires. Paul told Timothy, flee youthful lusts. And so there are things that we need to do in order to, to stop feeding the evil desires that lurk in our hearts. But honestly, physically cutting my eye out or cutting my hand off really isn't going to stop me from fantasizing. It's not going to hurt my imagination. I, I'll still be able to see with my mind's eye things that I shouldn't see. I'll be able to dream of things that I shouldn't dream of. Yeah, think about Tom in that illustration just a few moments ago. Tom tried everything. He tried all of the physical things, the things that we can do to stop, and it didn't because something else was feeding those lustful desires. And so what we need to evaluate, what is feeding these this God-given ability to desire, what is feeding that? And, and we feed our desire either to do the good or to do the evil. And so we need to, to discern, what am I feeding my soul, and will it benefit the, the good desires or the lustful desires? Like Tom, it might be other sins in your life that you need to, to expose and have Jesus deal with in your life. He's He's paid the penalty. He's, he's there to forgive. He's there to cleanse it. He's, he's ready to, to work in your heart and your life. Maybe it is uh, fantasies, imagination, uh, thinking of things and, and dreaming of things in our minds. For men, oftentimes it's, it's based upon an image. It's a picture. It's something physical that, that captures the, the imagination. For women, we've talked about this earlier, that for a woman, it's not so much the images as it is the feelings, the emotions, the, the attraction of, of a personal intimacy that leads us to, to lustful desires. Touch is another area. Uh, the touch, the physical touch, can, can be a, a powerful element in, in creating desire. I had a man, older man, in his 70s, who came into my study uh, one afternoon, and I could tell he was in a panic, and his eyes wide open, and he said, I've just come from Starbucks. He said, I, I was there and I, I, saw, I saw a woman that I'd, I'd seen years ago. I have a good friend from a long time ago. I hadn't seen her for a while and went over and I just put my arm around her just to say hi. And right away I knew that I had ignited lustful desire. Now, he didn't say lustful desire, but he said, I, I knew that this was wrong. And it was taking me down a bad path. And I had to come to my pastor and, and ask my pastor to pray for me. And so we prayed for him there. And he, he left that. They left my study that day free, uh, free from the bondage of lustful desire. Why? Because he was so sensitive. He knew, he was conscious, he was, he was aware of what fed that lustful desire, and he wanted to deal with it immediately. There's also emotional touch. And we need to be careful about that. The words that are said that, that all of a sudden ignite a, a sense of desire in our hearts and our lives. This is especially true of women especially true of women, because they can, they can sense that emotional uh, draw uh, and hear a man say something that excites their emotions, that, that ignites a passion in them, and all of a sudden that ignition becomes lustful desire, desiring another man for what the husband is to bring to their lives. 
who is going to rescue me from all of this? The Apostle Paul dealt with this in, in Romans chapter 7. He's, he's really wrestling with this, saying, what, what, the very things that I don't want to do, those are the things I find myself doing. And that is the case a lot of times with lustful desire. We find ourselves trapped in, in this, this, this prison of shame. Who will rescue me? Who will get me out of this? Who will deliver me? And notice that the Apostle Paul doesn't say, here are 10 tips for getting over it, or, or here are six things that you need to do to deal with your lustful desire. He doesn't give us any of that. He goes right to the heart of it. He says, thanks be to God through Christ Jesus. It begins with Jesus Christ. All of these other techniques and, and things that we do, yeah, they, they are important, but it begins with turning and looking to Jesus. First thing, when you want to turn and you want to look to Jesus, you need to take responsibility for your desires. We somehow think that our desires are, we're, we're just victims of this desire thing. No, you control. You have a will that's able to choose what you desire. And, and you need to ex exercise that will. James chapter 1, verses 13 to 15 say this, When tempted, nobody should say, God is tempting me. Don't blame it on other people. Don't blame it on God. Don't blame it on the, the girl or the guy. Take responsibility. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when, by his own evil desire, he's dragged away and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Oh, friends, take responsibility for your desires. Feed the desires that, that draw you to God, the desires that you have for fellowship and intimacy with Christ. Feed those desires and find ways to choke off the things that feed the desire for lust. Then secondly, recognize just how vulnerable you are. The Apostle Paul said, who will rescue? I, I have no one. I can't rescue myself. There's no one to rescue me, only Jesus. Until you get to that point, until you get to that point, you're going to try and you're going to fail. One of the worst things that I ever hear from someone is when they say, well, that will never happen to me. In fact, I'll tell you, some of my greatest spiritual heroes in life have been the ones who have fallen the hardest and the furthest. Why? Because they thought it couldn't happen to them. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 12 says this, this is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Apostle Paul recognized that there, there are things that are way, way above my power, my ability to, 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 to grab hold of. I, I need the power of Jesus. I need the, the power of Jesus Christ in my life. And when I am weakest, when I admit my vulnerability, then Christ can come in and supply me with the power and the energy that I need to overcome the temptation and to live gloriously, powerfully for him. And then turn to Jesus. Simply turn to Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. I like the words that the Apostle John wrote in John chapter 8. He tells about an occasion when Jesus was in the temple uh, teaching, and the Pharisees brought to him a woman who had been literally, literally caught in the act of adultery. I often wondered why they didn't bring the, the, the man along, too, because the capital punishment was for the man and the woman. But they, they brought this woman who had just been caught in the act of adultery before Jesus and said, now, Moses has lost this to stone her. What do you say? And Jesus I think in a very gracious manner, knelt down and began to write in the sand. I, everybody speculates what he wrote. Nobody knows. But in frustration, the, the Pharisees are like, oh, what should we do here, Jesus? And Jesus looks up and he says, listen, let's do it this way. The first one of you who has no sin gets to cast the first stone. How's that sound? And he leaned over and he began drawing in the sand again. And the scriptures, the way John records it, one by one, they started walking away from the oldest to the youngest. They all recognized that they had no right to condemn. 
And you see, Jesus was the only one who had any right to condemn. And so when we come to Jesus, when we turn to him, he's the only one who has any right to condemn. And we, we understand that, we know that. And that woman, that woman, I think, realized that. She says, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? And she says, no, Lord, no one has condemned me. Powerful words. And, and the word I want you to, to focus in upon there is Lord. There, there is a lordship issue that's going on there. And Jesus says, well, then neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. And that moment, hope was infused. As, as she realized a forgiveness, a ripping away of the shame that she felt, and an infusion of hope. Go, and in the power of Jesus, sin no more. Maybe you need to hear that today. Maybe you need to hear the, the glorious gospel of neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Because that's the starting line. That is the starting point of dealing with lustful desire. That is the starting point of dealing with all of these ills, really. To rely upon Jesus, to look to him. You know, as I have been preparing these messages on the Sermon on the Mount, I'm, I'm looking further ahead. I, there's, a, there's a current, there's a, a theme that keeps coming back to me. The Sermon on the Mount is not a code to live by. I hope you understand that, that the Sermon on the Mount is not, if you live this way, you get into heaven. No, it's because you are a citizen of heaven, you will want to, and you will be able to, by the power of Jesus, to live this way. No, it's not a code. I think it's a wake-up call. I think Jesus presents this as a wake-up call to us, that we need him more than we ever, ever thought we would. Our salvation is not just at that moment, that, that first initial time when we embrace Jesus as our Savior and Lord. We need saved continually from our sins, don't we? The Sermon on the Mount proves that out, doesn't it? It, it tells us where we fail and where we need to, to turn to him and ask him to be Lord of our life. That woman caught in adultery identified him as Lord. I repeat it again, is he Lord of your life? The song that we're going to conclude with today here is, is a song that is a, a song of submission, a song asking Jesus to make a difference in our lives. Here's my heart. Here's my will. Here's my strength. All of me, Lord, here it is. May it be yours. May you use me for your honor, your glory, your praise. Let's sing this song. Let's sing this song as a, a commitment to Christ and living out the, the Sermon on the Mount to his glory, to his praise, to his goodness.
So Lisa, thank you so much for leading us in our musical worship tonight. I trust the, the songs that we have sung this morning, and especially this last song of, of making Jesus Lord of everything in our life, has brought you a sense of victory. You see, giving our hearts and our lives to Jesus breaks the chains that, that bind us. One of those songs that I like to listen to in my headphones when I'm running, the song is called Breaking Free. Uh, break every chain. There, there's power in the name of Jesus. Break every chain. Break every chain. Uh, that is the cry of our heart. Is God, break every chain in my life that keeps me from the glory and the praise and the goodness of God. As I was wrapping up this message and this service, I, I thought, you know, we, we need to leave on a note of victory. We need to know the victory of Jesus. When we have committed ourselves to him and, and made him Lord of our lives, we want to know with assurance that God has given us Jesus as our victory. And one of the songs that we sang earlier, Living Hope, I think sings about that. That Jesus declared the grave has no claim on me. Jesus, yours is the victory. Well, we ought to do a reprise of that. Our, our benediction today will be our own song, singing about the greatness of God's victory in our hearts and our lives. So live in that victory this week. Grow in that victory. Experience the power of Jesus' name, uh, that you might gain the victory over, over your desires and channel your desires this week to glorify and honor him. Have a great week in the, in the glory and the power of Jesus' name. And I uh, look forward to coming back next week and uh, being together.